Welcome to Operating Systems. In today's lecture, we will talk about allocating the processor to processes, so scheduling as we call it. And first we will look at simple cases for scheduling, scheduling for single or uniprocessor systems. So scheduling is concerned with processes, so let's take a quick look back at processes. So we've seen that processes are still the central abstraction for anything that happens in a current operating system. So we call this simple activities. And uh, for processes, we have different views onto processes. So from the view of a process, the operating system creates the illusion of independent sequential control flows as a concept. So a process just uh, changes between CPU phases where it calculates things, we call them CPU bursts, and phases where it does input or output operations, we call these I.O. bursts. Now in real life we want a multiplexing of the CPU, so that means we want to have several processes using our CPU at the same time. And since our CPU can only execute a single machine instruction simultaneously, because we have a single processor system in uh, what we are considering here, uh, we need to switch the processor between the different processes that want to execute at the same time. And we've already seen that Unix systems provide a set of system calls to create and to manage processes, and that Unix processes also have different facilities to communicate with each other and to synchronize between each other. In addition, modern operating systems also support more lightweight abstractions compared to processes, so-called lightweight processes or threads and featherweight processes. So these have different properties compared to traditional processes. For example, uh, these lightweight processes might be able to share, uh, to share their memory space. And all processes have to be controlled by the operating system in order to enable a coordinated execution of all the processes in our system. So uh, essentially we can preempt some resources, especially resources such as the CPU or our main memory, which has to be shared between our different processes in our system. So when we look at the life of a process, we have already seen the different states in a very simple diagram and then in a more complex diagram a process can be in. But we need to consider even additional states for our process and we call them dispatch states. So depending on the level you do CPU allocation, every process is assigned a logical state and this logical state represents this dispatch state at any given point in time. So on the one hand, we have the short time scheduling and we had a look at short time scheduling in very simple uh, terms before when we looked at process states. So we have processes in a ready state. So they're just waiting for the CPU to be allocated to them. We have one process on a single processor system that's in the running state. So it's currently using the CPU. It was allocated the CPU. And we have maybe one or more processes in a blocked state, which means they are waiting for the completion of some I.O. operation they requested. But in addition to this short-term CPU scheduling, we can have longer-term CPU scheduling approaches. So we can have medium-term scheduling. So medium-term determines if a process is actually kept in memory or not. So if a process might be swapped out but ready, so it could use the CPU but it doesn't have memory allocated to itself, so it would need memory first before it can be allocated to the CPU, or it can be swapped and blocked. So it initiated a long running I.O. operation and while this I.O. operation was running, our process can't, couldn't execute anything, so our operating system decided to swap the process's memory pages out to secondary storage. And so it's waiting for I.O. and it's also waiting to get its memory back. And then finally, we can have long-term scheduling, and this involves process creation and termination of processes. So uh, we can uh, formulate something like a rule of thumb, uh, which sort of uh, scheduling, which time duration of scheduling we have in a system. If we look at the uh, frequency, how often a state change occurs. So for short-term scheduling, this might be in the range of microseconds to milliseconds. For medium-term scheduling, this could be in the range of milliseconds to seconds or even minutes, and long-term scheduling could involve minutes 
two hours. So we have very long running processes. And in some server systems, some processes are started when the system is started and are only stopped when the system is shut down. So this can even extend hours. A process like a web server can run for days or even months as long as you don't have to reboot your computer. So short time scheduling we've already seen the different process states and scheduling now has the task of switching a process state between these different states. So we've seen we have a ready state. So a process that is in uh, the state ready is yeah, prepared to be executed by the CPU. So it has all the resources it needs except the CPU. So uh, there can be multiple processes uh, on that ready uh, in that ready state. So the operating system keeps a waiting list or ready list uh, for CPU allocation. And when uh, the operating system chooses to move a process from ready into running, then it chooses the first process on that list. And the list position of an element of a process in this waiting list or ready list depends on the scheduling algorithm we're using. We'll take a closer look at that in a bit. We have our running state. So running means the process was ready before and then it was allocated to the CPU. So it has all the resources it needs to continue executing. So this means when a process is running, it is computing something. So it's executing code calculations, jumps, whatever. So this is what we call the CPU burst. So there's a continuous sequence of instruction execution, so CPU activity. And for a single processor system, as we've already seen, there is only one single running process at any given moment in time. For a multiprocessor system, it would be one running process per CPU in our system. And finally, for short-term scheduling, we have the blocked state. So blocked means a process waits for an event because a process has requested an I.O. input-output operation from the operating system. I.O. operations tend to take longer, so we call this an I.O. burst. So something which keeps the hardware and potentially the operating system busy. But while this I.O. burst is uh, currently running, our process cannot continue running because it has to syn uh, synchronously wait for the completion of I.O. So our process in a blocked state waits for the occurrence of at least one condition, for example, a signaling that the I.O. burst has terminated. In medium term scheduling, we're concerned with swapping processes in and out of main memory. So we've already seen in our discussion about memory management that if we are uh, low on memory. So if we have more processes or if we have a number of processes that demand more memory than we have physically available, then we have to copy and move out some of the main memory pages that are currently not used to secondary storage. So to, do a, to, to an SSD or to a swap space on a hard disk. And uh, in a simple model, we've seen if we don't use paging, we can swap a process out completely and can swap it in again. So if a process is completely swapped out, it means the complete contents of the process's address space are removed from main memory and then stored safely in our background storage. So somewhere in our swap space. And since we know the memory contents of that process that currently is unable to execute are on the background storage, we can reuse the main memory it was using for something else. So for the allocations of different processes. So if this has happened to a process, a process has to wait to be swapped in. And now it can be in two different states. It can be in a swapped out ready state. We call this ready suspend. So uh, CPU allocation ignores this process because it's ready, but it's not in main memory. So it first needs memory. But of course, this process has everything except for the CPU and memory. So this process can be kept on a waiting list for memory allocation. And when it has memory allocated, then it still needs the CPU to run. On the other hand, we can have a swapped out block state or block suspend. So this means the process has initiated an IO operation. So it waits for an event. So it is blocked. But in addition to just being blocked and waiting, it was also swapped out to secondary storage by the operating system. And so uh, it has to wait for the operating system. The operating system takes note of this waiting condition and it knows it's swapped out at the moment. So as soon as this event happens, then the 
process is changed into this ready suspend state we've just seen before, which means it now only needs memory and the CPU to continue operating. Now finally, for long-term scheduling, we've already seen that processes are created or can be created, so they're in a state new and they would be ready to be started. So we've seen that fork is one of the Unix methods or the central Unix method to create new processes. So a process in new state means that an instance was created and it was assigned to a program on the disk. So we have loaded at least the information that a program is what should be executed in a process and uh, it can still be that the allocation of the resource memory might be outstanding for example when we have a paging system and this paging system only pages in the physical page frames of the process address space on demand so when we're executing code in an address range or when we execute a machine instruction that exec uh, exec accesses data in one of the pages of our process on the other hand, processes can be terminated, so they're in a special exit state, and then they would wait for their removal. So we have the exit and wait system calls. So uh, when this happens, the process is terminated, its resources are released, but we've seen that uh, for a process to successfully terminate, we need the parent process to wait for it. And so uh, unless this happens, our process is in this more or less indeterminate zombie state we've already seen before, and uh, it has to wait until it's cleaned up. And this cleanup after process termination can be performed by a different process as we've seen in Unix before. So when we look at all of our process states we have in our extended dispatch or scheduling model here, we have our traditional three state uh, short-term scheduling here so a process can uh, change between ready running and blocked states but in addition we can create processes now we can have a new process which can go immediately to ready or a new process can be to ready can be in ready suspended as long as it doesn't have any memory allocated only a running process can exit because exit is a system call that has to be ex uh, actively executed and we now have changes from a ready state. So in ready state, you can be swapped out and you can be swapped in back in again. So you're back in ready again. And the same thing can happen from a blocked state. So we can move from a blocked state to blocked suspend, or we can move back to blocked even. Or when our IO operation has finished, but we're still blocked, we could, uh, we're no longer blocked, uh, we can move to ready suspend here. So these numbers uh, here correspond to four events we describe on the next slide. And in the following, uh, the rest of this lecture, we will focus on short-term scheduling. So uh, let's talk about the points at which scheduling can actually take place. Now, every transition into a ready state, so whenever we want to uh, change the state of a process to ready, uh, this transition has to update the CPU waiting queue. So the operating system has to take a decision about where our process or the process control block describing our process that is transitioned into ready state is located in the ready queue. So uh, it could be like just you have a queue and it's inserted at the back, but you might have some different priorities. So a process that changes into ready state might well get an earlier place in our queue. So this result, so where a process ends up in our waiting queue, in our ready queue, depends on the CPU allocation strategy of the system. And we'll see different approaches to this in a bit. So when does scheduling and rescheduling take place? Now, first, after a process is created, because we have a new process in our system that has to be considered for CPU allocation now. Second, if a process yields control of the CPU, so if a process for example, uh, voluntarily gives up the CPU because, uh, well, it uh, starts, uh, well, to do something else. Uh, um, if the event the process is waiting for takes place, so we're from blocked to ready again, and when a swapped out process is considered for CPU allocation again. These four numbers here correspond to the state transitions to our edges in the diagram of the previous page. Now we've already seen we have two different approaches that 
enable us to give up control of the CPU. So we can have cooperative multitasking, which means that the process has to actively give up control of the CPU. And uh, we can have preemptive multitasking or preemptive scheduling, which means a process can be forced to release or yield the CPU. So this is what preemptive scheduling uses. And for this, we usually need hardware support, for example, using a timer interrupt that interrupts the execution of the currently running program with a certain frequency, like every 10 milliseconds. Uh, it invokes the operating system, and then the operating system can decide to do something else, like change the scheduling of the CPU. So, which scheduling algorithms do we have? Now, uh, let's start with a very simple one, and this very simple one is called FCFS, First Come, First Serve. And this is, uh, as I said, a very simple algorithm and maybe fair, well, maybe not. And the cre queuing criterion, so uh, the criterion uh, which place in our waiting queue a process that changes to ready gets, is the arrival time of a process. So processes that arrive later in the ready queue are put to the back of the ready queue. This algorithm here is non-preempting and it assumes cooperating processes. So as an example here, we have four processes A, B, C, D, and they arrive at the points in time 0, 1, 2, and 3. So of course we are omitting any time units here because we're doing an abstract analysis of what happens. Uh, we consider the running or service time of a process. So process A runs for one time unit, process B runs for 100 time units, process C again runs for one time unit, and process D again runs for 100 time units. So since all processes here in our cooperating model run till the end, say they run for the service time there uh, that is indicated for the process. So let's assume at point in time zero, we have a free CPU. So process A arrives. So it starts at point in time zero and it runs for one time unit. So it ends at one. Uh, accordingly, we have a uh, process B, this arrives at point in time one, it runs for 100 time units, so it starts right after process A at point in time one and ends at 101. So from one to 101, it uses 100 units. Process C comes later, so it has to wait until process A and B are finished. So this means it can only start after B has finished, so B ends at 101. C and uh, that starts at 101, it only runs for one time unit, so it ends at 102. And finally, D arrives at point in time three, it also runs for 100 units, so it has to start after C, because it arrives after C, and it runs from 102 to 202. So essentially, the uh, runtime of a process here is the time that is required until the CPU actually finishes executing. So the difference between the end of the execution of a process and the start of the execution. So essentially we have a runtime of 199, for example, for process D, because that's 202 minus three. Now, if we look at process C, this process has a runtime of 100 because it arrives at point in time two and it ends at 102. Now, if we look at the runtime divided by the service time, this means process C is quite disadvantaged here because it only runs for one time unit, but it is in the system from its arrival time two to its finishing time 102 for 100 time units. So if we divide the running time by the service time, it means it has to wait for 100 times longer than its execution time is. And that's probably a very bad example for this uh, because uh, it's a short running process it wouldn't really impact the other processes much if it came earlier but due to our strict policy that processes are scheduled according to their arrival time order it has to wait until this long running process b here has finished executing So the effect that you could observe with our simple example for first come first serve is the so-called convoy effect. So this problem that a short running process has to wait until other long running processes that have arrived earlier are finished 
uh, is what we call the Conway, uh, Conway effect. And this affects short-running processes, usually that are I.O. intensive, so they initiate an I.O. operation after a very short processing phase. And uh, if these I.O. intensive processes follows, so is arriving after a long CPU intensive process, then it has to wait. So it means that processes with long CPU bursts benefit from first come first serve and processes with short CPU bursts accordingly are disadvantaged here. What FC, uh, FCFS does is it, manage, uh, it manages to minimize the number of context switches in our system because it always waits for a process to complete. But due to this Conway effect, we have a number of problems. One of the problems is, uh, are that we have a large response time. So this process, which would only take one time unit to execute, uh, essentially, we have to wait for almost 200 time units for uh, getting its results. And accordingly, we have low I.O. throughput because processes that do lots of I.O. Uh, have to wait until processes uh, that arrived earlier, which do long CPU bursts, are actually finished. So if a system runs a mix of CPU and I.O. intensive processes, first come, first serve is not a suitable approach. So it's typically only used in what we call batch processing systems, where we have a number of tasks that can be executed one after the other uh, without any user interactions as expected. So let's take a look at another classical scheduling approach. This one's called round robin or simply RR after uh, an English children's game uh, where, where you select uh, kids in a game uh, in a round. So uh, round robin reduces the disadvantage of processes with short CPU bursts. So everyone has to fight for themselves. And round robin now splits the available processor time in so-called time slices. Uh, so time slices are relatively short durations of time, uh, which uh, yeah define how long a process can run uninterrupted. And when the end of that time slice is reached, so when this time slice, as we call it, is used up, then a process which can, but not must, occur. So if a process which occurs at the end of a time slice, uh, the operating system interferes, uh, the interrupted process is moved to the end of the ready list, and then the next process is selected from the ready list according to first come, first serve. So all the processes that have used up their time slice are just added to the back of our waiting list for uh, in uh, our ready state and then the operating system chooses the first one so the one that arrived earliest in the ready list to be allocated the cpu so round robin uses uh, a protection of cpu access because it doesn't have to wait for a process to terminate but a timer enforces an interrupt at the end of each time slice so the operating system has to program this timer, which is a component on your CPU or on your system on chip somewhere. And this timer is then programmed to generate a hardware interrupt every, for example, 10 milliseconds. And this hardware interrupt switches execution to the operating system, which can then decide if a rescheduling needs to take place. Now, uh, is this approach more efficient than the first come first serve itself? Now, this depends essentially on the chosen length of the time slice. So if our time slice we chose is too long, we just degenerate everything to first come, first serve, because our processes tend to terminate in, uh, well, the time slice that were allocated instead of being interrupted in their execution when their time slice ended. If, on the other hand, our time slice duration is too short, then we have uh, very many process switches, so a process which involves switching to the operating system, executing this interrupt handler code uh, that handles the timer interrupt, uh, selecting a process to uh, be scheduled, taking another process, putting it into the ready list, and then switching back to that new process. So if our time slices are too short, our operating system has to continuously mostly work on switching processes and not on executing process code. So there's a rule of thumb, and this says time slices should be a bit longer than the duration of a typical interaction. Now, obviously, this can be interpreted in a wide range of ways. So what are the problems uh, when we use round robin? Now, there's a performance problem, and this performance problem involves I.O. intensive processes. We know that I.O. intensive processes only have very short CPU bursts, and 
uh, after a short CPU burst, they initiate an I.O. burst, so they initiate an I.O. operation. So an I.O. intensive process tends to not use uh, their time slice fully, but it already yields the CPU by calling an I.O. operation before the time slice is used up. So this process then blocks. When it blocks, it's only added back to the ready list when the respective I.O. operation, I.O. burst, is finished. A CPU intensive process, on the other hand, uses its time slice completely. So if this CPU intensive process is preempted at the end of the time slice, it's immediately added to the end of the ready list. So the amount of CPU time that's distributed to processes is not equally distributed. And this means that due to CPU intensive processes being ready immediately after they, their time slice has ended, this means that they get a larger share of the CPU uh, time, so this is not a fair scheduling algorithm. So I.O. intensive processes are not served as well as CPU intensive processes. Uh, in turn, I.O. intensive processes tend to uh, request I.O. operations less frequently because they're scheduled less often, so the utilization of I.O. devices can be low. In addition, the variance of the response time of I.O. intensive processes also increases with round robin. So again, here we have a scheduling approach, which looks simple, but also has a number of disadvantages, depending on your mix of processes you're going to use. So in order to avoid this unequal distribution of CPU time with the round robin algorithm we've seen on the previous slide, uh, the virtual round robin algorithm was introduced. So virtual round robin adds a list to our scheduling, and this is a so-called preferred list. So a process is added to a preferred list when its I.O. burst ends. So it's not just added to the end of the ready list, but it's put on a separate list, and this preferred list, as the name says, is preferably considered and this means whenever we have a scheduling decision to take a process into the running state, our operating system now first checks if there is a process on the preferred list and takes the first one on that list. And only if there are no processes on the preferred list left, then it considers the ready list. So virtual round robin uh, enables this by using time slices of different lengths. So uh, processes on the preferred list are not allocated a complete new time slice because this would then prefer I.O. intensive processes, but processes on the preferred list are only allocated a partial time slice. So uh, the operating system uh, actually takes a note of the remaining time slice when an I.O. operation is initiated. So when we've only used 10% of a time slice and then initiate an I.O. operation, then we get a remaining time slice, for example, of 90%, which we are allocated. So a process in virtual round robin that has uh, performed I.O. and is added to the preferred list can only use the remaining runtime they did not use in the previous time slice. And if their CPU burst lasts longer, then they're just moved to the ready list. So scheduling in virtual round robin is a bit more complex, so it involves a bit more overhead than regular round robin because we have to keep a second list, this preferred list, have to check this in order, and we have to keep track and calculate the remaining runtime for an I.O. operation of a process, so whenever a process ends its time slice early. Now, of course, uh, we have still yet uh, another set of uh, scheduling algorithms which come from schedu uh, classical scheduling theory. And the next one we're going to present here is called shortest process next or SPN. So uh, this is a variant of first come first serve. So uh, it intends to reduce the disadvantage of short CPU bursts with first come first serve. And this means it lets the shortest process actually takes precedence, so the shortest process comes first. Now, there's uh, two problems with this approach. So the first problem, like first come, first serve, uh, this assumes no preemption, so a process runs to completion. And uh, if we want to consider the shortest process, of course, we have to know which of our processes that want to execute is actually the shortest process. And for many processes, this is difficult to say, so we require knowledge about process runtimes in order to efficiently apply this scheduling approach. So this main problem is predicting runtimes, and uh, for different approaches, like if we have batch processing in our system, then the programmer 
should annotate the required time limit, whereas if we have interactive processing, then the time limit is just estimated based on previous lengths of previous CPU bursts of the same process we're considering here. Response times can be reduced significantly because short processes come early and so the overall system performance is increased. But if we have a large number of newly started short-term processes, so processes with a short runtime, these come before long-running processes. So if we have a frequent arrival of short-running processes, this would mean our long-running processes would have to wait and wait and wait so they could actually starve. So they could never be allocated to CPU because there's a continuous flow of this short-running processes incoming. So in order to uh, make this effect less drastic, we could actually uh, use a weighting of the CPU bursts with SPN. And this uh, means that CPU bursts that lie further in the past should be weighted less. So essentially, uh, we uh, calculate uh, the priority according to some weighting factor alpha for uh, the current time, and then one minus alpha for our previous factor here. So values of this factor alpha are between one and zero. And this factor represents the relative weighting of a single CPU burst in the timeline of a process. And we can solve this recursively by always replacing Sn, Sn plus one with a respective partial formula. So essentially we have Sn plus one equals alpha Tn plus one minus alpha and then we replace S1 again recursively by its own formula here. So times alpha Tn minus one plus and so on. Or it's simply alpha times the sum of all the previous n CPU bursts over uh, this here. So for example, for an alpha of 0 0.8, we would have this weighting here. So this is a statistical approach and we also call this exponential smoothing. Yet another approach to solve the problems with shortest process next is called shortest remaining term time first. And this extends our shortest process next with preemption. So this is an appropriate approach also for interactive operation of computers. And this results in improved runtimes. So a running process is preempted if the expected CPU runtime is less than the rest of the CPU runtime. So the expected CPU burst lengths uh, is the first parameter here. And if this is actually lower than our remaining process uh, time, then we, we are preempted. So this is different to round robin because shortest remaining time first is not based on timer interrupts, but nevertheless preemptive. Uh, but it means we have to estimate burst lengths instead. So we have to know how long a CPU calculation actually takes place before the next IO operation actually is initiated. Uh, like with SPN, here with shortest remaining time first, process can also starve using this approach. So this is also not an ideal solution, obviously. So we can also try to solve this starvation problem here. And this is a variant of shortest remaining time first, which is called highest response ratio next or HRN. And this uh, considers the so-called aging of processes. So their waiting time which is the waiting time the process has accumulated so far and the expected service time. So we add the waiting time and the expected service time divided by the service time and get our factor R here. And HRN now always selects the process with the highest value of R. So where this relation here has the highest numerical value. Again, because we don't know the actual service times of a process, we have to apply an estimation of the service time as we've seen before. Yet another approach to scheduling CPUs, and you see there's a lot of them and we're only covering uh, the most common or interesting ones. Uh, this one's called feedback. So in feedback, short processes obtain an advantage without having to estimate the relative lengths of processes. So the basis for this feedback approach is the penalization of run long running processes and processes with feedback uh, scheduling are preempted. So our feedback approach uses multiple ready lists and these ready lists are assigned a certain priority. So the higher the priority, the uh, earlier a process in this list of a certain priority can uh, be assigned the CPU. Uh, 
So when a process arrives for the first time, it is assigned the highest priority. And then when a time slice is used up by this process, then it's a longer running process. So we move it down to the next lower priority until we arrive at the lowest level and the lowest priority level then just works according to round robin. So if we have short processes, they finish in a relatively short amount of time. So they stay at a high priority level because there's not too many time slices ending, shifting them down to a lower priority level. But again, long processes can starve here. But it is also possible to consider the waiting time for a process in this feedback scheduling to move a process back to a higher priority level. And this is also just called anti-aging. So here we have a visualization of our feedback scheduling model here. Whenever a new process is generated or created here, it enters the uh, first come first serve queue with the highest priority. So a time quantum of two to the zeros here. And this is then processed in order to provide CPU allocation. When uh, this process here that was allocated to the CPU is preempted, then it's moved to the next longer priority queue and so on until it arrives at the priority queue for first come first serve with the largest time quantum here. Now this is working round robin because we have no lower priority level. So when uh, one of these processes here is actually scheduled, and this can only happen if this queue and all the others above are empty, then uh, when actually it's time slice is used up, it's just being put back to the start of this lowest priority queue here. Now what can happen here is anti-aging. So uh, whenever we have a long waiting time, we just move a process back up to a higher priority queue here. And finally, when a process exits, it's of course just removed from the queues. And this is so-called uh, so multi-level feedback queue system because we have this feedback here either moving a process down or moving a process back up using anti-aging when it has accumulated a high waiting time. So what we've introduced here with our feedback scheduling are priorities. So these process priorities significantly influence the scheduling decisions an operating system takes. Uh, so we can actually have two different uh, approaches to priorities. Uh, the one simpler one are called static priorities. So static priorities are defined when a process is created and they do not change while the process is executing. So they stay the same until our process terminates. So assigning just static priorities enforces a deterministic ordering of processes. And as we've seen, we can also introduce dynamic priorities, which are updated while the process is running. So usually the operating system updates these priorities, but we can also have the user influence the priorities of processes the user itself started because maybe the computer is reacting too low, uh, too slow and a process that is using up much CPU time is given a lower priority because we want to do something interactive with our computer here. And the uh, shortest process next, shortest remaining time first, HRN and feedback are special cases of this dynamic priority approach. Now, all these scheduling strategies considered separately have all, all have their advantages and disadvantages. So what we can do is we can combine different scheduling algorithms on different levels and we call this multi-level scheduling. So we can use them, yeah, more or less simultaneously, for example, to support both interactive and background processing in a system. Or for example, for an embedded system, we might have processes that are real-time sensitive and we have, might have processes that do not require real-time processes uh, processing. So uh, when we have multi-level scheduling, this means that in the first example, interactive, and in the second example, real-time critical processes would be preferred because they uh, are more critical to getting their CPU time. So an implementation of multi-level scheduling typically uses multiple ready lists to uh, control CPU access and every ready list has its own CPU scheduling strategy and the lists themselves uh, are typically processed using priority first come first serve or round robin. Overall, as you can imagine, this is a very complex approach. So uh, essentially, uh, whenever you don't need it, you should try to avoid it. And this feedback scheduling we've seen before can be seen as a special case of this multi-level scheduling approach.
So multi-level scheduling could look like this. We have processes from the highest to the lowest priority and for example system processes could get the highest priority so they have their own queue here. Then we have interactive processes which should have a short response time. Then we have batch processes which are not as important and well of course take this with a grain of salt. If we still have time left we have student processes executing where, where it's not that important how long they take. Well of course that's just a little joke. So when we want to decide which scheduling algorithm to use in our operating system, uh, we actually need some objectives to help us with the evaluation. So there's two classes of objectives. The first one is user-oriented. So you, one user-oriented uh, objective could be the runtime. So the time needed for a process between its start and the termination, including the waiting times. Uh, this is useful for batch processing. We could also consider the response time, which is the time that passes between a user input and the response of a program, so when it's finally scheduled and can generate reactions. This is very important for interactive systems. We can also consider the so-called tardiness, so if we have to interact with external physical processes, we have to meet deadlines in a real-time system, so this might be uh, important in these scenarios, and we can also uh, try to uh, evaluate the predictability of a system. So predictability means that processes are always processed identically, independent of the system load, and this is required for so-called hard real-time systems. So a hard real-time system is a system that can cause a catastrophe in, co uh, in case a deadline is actually missed by a process. So we want this predictability to know that we are executing a safe uh, scheduling system here. Now, on the other hand, we can also use system-oriented objectives to evaluate scheduling algorithm. And some of the system-oriented objectives are the throughput. So throughput means we want to finish as many processes as possible per time unit. The CPU load, we want to ensure the CPU is kept busy at all times. Uh, so this also means we want to avoid overhead for scheduling decisions or context switches. We might want to provide fairness, so no process should be disadvantaged, for example, by starvation. And we might also be interested in load balancing, so uh, I.O. devices should also be utilized uniformly. So uh, we can do a quantitative comparison of uh, different scheduling algorithms here. So, for example, we have five processes with a given start time of 0, 2, 4, 6, and 8, and different service times here. So uh, we now consider for all of the algorithms when this specific process ends, what the runtime is and what the ratio of uh, the service time and runtime is. And then we can look at the average of the processes to take a look at which of the processes actually, uh, well, which of the scheduling algorithms actually is best for this configuration of processes here. So if we take a look at the averages, we find that shortest remaining time first, for our example here, would provide us with the shortest runtime on average of 7.2 and also the lowest ratio of runtime to service time, which is 1.59. So for this given scenario here, uh, our quantitative evaluation would show that shortest remaining time first would have an advantage. But of course, it means we need to know the service time, which in the general case is not known and can only be estimated. So in real-world applications, another scheduling algorithms, uh, algorithm might have an advantage. And we can also do a general qualitative comparison of our scheduling approaches or strategies. So uh, we have different criteria for this. So the first one is if we have a cooperative system, so we wait for the termination of processes, or if we use a preemptive approach where we interrupt a process using a time slice based approach or preemption at start here. The next criterion is if prediction is required, then we uh, need to consider the implementation overhead, which can uh, start from minimal to quite a large implementation overhead for feedback uh, scheduling and highest remaining uh, next. Uh, we can also consider if starvation of a process is possible here. And finally, we can see if there are special effects on processes like the Conway effect or disadvantages for say, CPU or I.O. intensive processes. So this is a table that could help you to 
decide which scheduling algorithm to use and real operating systems usually use a combination of these in order to provide a good mix of yeah a good good conditions for a mix of processes so in a typical for example desktop computer system you have like a number of interactive processes running well with user interactions that should have short response times because the user doesn't want to wait for a keyboard press key press or, or a mouse click uh, to be acted upon and on the other hand you have some background processes running for example uh, indexing your hard disk uh, and, and uh, running network services and so on uh, that should also have uh, some useful IO throughput. So how does scheduling in Unix work? Now in Unix we have a two-step preemptive approach and the objective of scheduling in Unix is to reduce response times. Unix doesn't provide long-term scheduling but it has a high-level scheduling approach that's mid-term using swapping of processes and it has low-level scheduling that's short-term preemptive we're using a multi-level feedback queue and dynamic process priorities and these process priorities are calculated to this formula here so the process of a priority is calculated as the sum of its cpu usage plus something we call a nice factor plus some base value for a process now every second these processes are, uh, that are running are evaluated and with every tick uh, which is one tenth of a second uh, the usage entitlement uh, of a process for the CPU is reduced by increasing this CPU usage and this is checked once a second here. Uh, in, uh, so this means if we have a high priority value here we have a low CPU priority that the process actually gets. And the amount of CPU usage over time is reduced or smoothed and this smoothing function to uh, not penalize a process that has initially had a high CPU uh, usage but not now, this smoothing function is different in various different versions of Unix. So this is an example how 4.3 BSD Unix actually uh, does its calculations. So the priority of a user process is determined as every fourth tick, so every 40 milliseconds here, and this is calculated, so the priority here, as the minimum of the user priority plus the CPU priority over four plus two times its nice factor, so a, a specifically given slowdown factor, uh, or 127, which is the maximum level we can achieve for a priority here. And remember, a priority that's higher means we get a lower share of the CPU. So PCPU, this value here, is incremented by one with every tick and this is smoothed one by, uh, once per second, so we consider the system load here and the previous CPU load plus the nice factor to calculate our new PCPU value here. And uh, there's a different approach to smoothing processes that are woken up, which were blocked for more than one second. And this actually uh, chooses the approach which is load-based and then uh, the longer our sleep time is, uh, the more this factor here is considered. So uh, smoothing takes place using a decay filter for an assumed average load of 1. This would be PCPU equals to 0.66 times the old PCPU plus the nice factor. And in addition, if we assume that a process collects ti ticks in a time interval i and has a nice factor of 0, then we can see that an additional CPU load here, T0, is only uh, added to the CPU priority at interval 5 with about one, uh, 0.13. So this means that the influence of something that's very long in the past, so 5 time intervals past, is lower and lower the more time actually passes. So after 5 seconds, only 13% of the old CPU load at Times, uh, at time zero is actually considered with this 4.3 BSD Unix uh, smoothing, smoothing approach. approach. Windows, Windows NT uh, uses, uses priority, priority classes, classes for scheduling. So, so NT has a preemptive priority and time slice based thread scheduling. So as we've seen, NT has introduced threads earlier than Unix. And in NT, preemption also occurs for threads that are executed in the kernel. So when we're in kernel mode doing something, we could also be preempted. This is different to Unix, where uh, you could not, can usually not be preempted in kernel mode. 
If you have processes of the same priority, uh, then Windows NT, and of course all the succeeding uh, operating systems up to Windows 10 use a round-robin approach. So there's a reserve priority of zero, then you have a variable priorities here, and you have some real-time priorities for processes that have to perform some real-time uh, tasks. So uh, the thread type, so in Windows NT you can have a for or background thread, determines the time quantum that's available to the thread, and uh, Windows NT now performs something we call quantum stretching. So a quantum, this time quantum between 6 and 36, is reduced by either 3 or 1 with every tick if the thread changes to the waiting state and the time slice length varies with the process and can be between 20 and 180 milliseconds. So this depends on if you have a foreground or background process and if your system is running in a server or in a desktop configuration. In addition, NT-based systems have variable priorities which are calculated as the sum of the process priority class and a relative thread priority and a boost you can get, for example, in Windows NT when a process received mouse input. So uh, how do these adaptive priorities work? So thread priorities are dynamically increased when certain conditions are given, and this is the so-called dynamic boosts. And we have different boosts that a process can get. So it gets more CPU time for the next scheduling decision. So for example, if a uh, this I.O. is completed, gets a boost of 1. When, when we have mouse movement or keyboard input, we want to prefer interactive processes, we get a boost of 6. When the process is deblocked or releases release resources, so uses semaphores or events or mutexes, it gets a boost of 1. Some other events like network or pipeline activity get a boost of 2. And if there's some other event in the foreground process, we also get a boost of 2. So we see that these numbers can be carefully cho chosen uh, in order to provide a smooth operation of the system for the user as well as for background processes. And these dynamic boosts are decreased again, so they use up with every tick, so it's not a permanent boost, but just a one-shot boost in case, uh, well, some event, as we've seen before, happens. Now, uh, Windows NT also guarantees progress, so Windows NT avoids the installation of threads, so uh, up to 10 of these disadvantaged threads that have to wait long are allocated a high priority 15 for two time slices every three to four seconds. So as you can see, scaling in Windows NT is quite a complex system with all these boosts and progress guarantees going on. So to conclude our lecture, we've seen that operating systems take CPU scheduling decisions on three different levels. We have long-term scheduling, that determines the admission and of process to the system as the process leaving the system again. We have medium-term scheduling that is controlled by the swapping of processes, and then we have our short-term scheduling, which was uh, covered by most of the lecture today, which def uh, determines short-term CPU allocation, so in the micro to millisecond level. All algorithms we have discussed in this lecture are considered short-term scheduling approaches. We have different user and system-oriented criteria to assess the properties of such a short-term CPU scheduling algorithm. And we've seen the selection of an approach can be difficult and can have unexpected negative side effects. So the best approach uh, needs to be determined uh, by an analysis of the typical profiles of our application. So maybe if we have a mix of foreground and background processes, for example, and all the other given constraints in the system. So essentially, it's quite overhead and it's not obvious which scheduling uh, approach to choose when you're designing an operating system. And maybe in a more complex operating system, we've seen it for Unix and Windows NT, we might use a combination of scheduling approaches to provide good services for different user scenarios of your computer. So that's all for today. Thanks for listening. And until next time, bye.